All right, let's uh, come to now the second and third interpretive issue. But before we discuss them, let's, uh, let's think in terms of where we are as far as the Gospel of Matthew is concerned. The first uh, two chapters are the prologue. But it seems as though the prologue uh, begins with a statement that is a title uh, because it is not a complete sentence. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, if, if again, you're a Jewish individual familiar with the Septuagint, when you hear the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, immediately you will think of the Septuagint of Genesis chapter 5, which is uh, significantly the book of the genealogy of Adam. And so the, the, the statement is exactly the same as the introduction in Genesis 5.1. The only difference is Jesus Christ is replaced by the word Adam. Now, obviously, you think right away of Adam, the first man, and Jesus Christ, who comes to reverse and to restore what was lost in Adam. For who was the first ruler whom God determined to rule over the earth? Genesis 1, 26 to 28, Adam. Subdue and rule. And of course, by the time you get to 5 1, all right, what did, what, what did Adam beget? What did he bring forth? This book of the generations, the book of the Toledot of Adam. Adam didn't bring rule, he didn't bring life, he brought rebellion and death. And so even before we get to David and Abraham, as far as the Old Testament, you know, we're reminded, okay, the, the Abrahamic, the Davidic promise, even in the Old Testament, was ultimately to reverse what was lost in Adam. Now, this echoes, the, uh, with the term book, echoes uh, 5.1, but just the term genealogy. Was the, was the Septuagintal translation for the Hebrew term Toledot. And of course, as you think through the, uh, the Torah, and of course, those who want to make, you know, the, uh, the five books equal, the books want, okay, the first division ending in chapter 7 begins in 1-1. One, one. This is Genesis, and Genesis is the book of the Toledots, and this is the Toledot of Jesus Christ. But certainly there is, is, is an echo, and I think distinctly so by Matthew, that he is picking up, and if we can put it this way, in some way completing what began in the Old Testament. And so just as a Toledot statement stands as a heading for narrative in Genesis, this statement, and I think is pretty well agreed, as you can see by commentators, in some ways stands as an introduction to something in the Gospel of Matthew. It introduces, it's the, it's the title. And just as the Toledot statements in Genesis introduce, this title introduces. But introduces what? 
Well, the most popular position is it introduces the genealogy. And certainly, son of David, son of Abraham, verse 2, to Abraham. And verse 6, and to David. So yes, it does introduce the, the genealogy. But on the basis of Genesis 5.1, Toledot introduces more than the genealogy. For the Toledot also introduces, after the genealogy of chapter 5, the narrative of chapter 6, verses 1 to 8, that uh, introduces us to the sin of mankind that is going to bring forth God's judgment in the flood. So it seems on the basis of the example of Genesis we would expect not only genealogy, but genealogy followed by narrative. And so here's a place right here, even my, even my beloved mentor would only see it as the genealogy, I would say it's the genealogy plus narrative. Now the only question is, how extensive is that narrative? Those who see it as introducing the genealogy and narrative We'll usually see it as the next paragraph or all the way through chapter 2, verse 23. It entails the birth narrative. Some, although none of the commentators I've recommended, would see it as going through the first unit of the book, which they would take all the way to 4.16. Particularly those influenced by Kingsbury. A threefold division. Okay, this, this is the introduction, this is the title to to the genealogy and the introductory narrative, however one would see the length of that narrative. And frankly, until two or three years ago, I, I, I pretty much took position B. I moved from A to B. I never was at C, so I skipped C. And more and more as I've studied Matthew, I now am led more to see position D. You say, how did you come to that conclusion? Because I studied the Gospel of Mark. You say, well, why did the Gospel of Mark influence you as far as Matthew? You become a source critic or something? Matthew, Mark's first? No, 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 no. But we're going to see the same phenomenon in the Gospel of Mark. And it's very, very clear in the Gospel of Mark that that first non-sentence introduction, I believe, can be shown exegetically clearly as an introduction to the book as a whole. Now, if God the Holy Spirit allows Mark to give a, a title which in some way defines his purpose, and in Luke, at the beginning, as we've already seen in Luke 1, 3, and 4, we have a clear statement of Luke's purpose. And in the Gospel of John, in chapter 20, once the basic uh, narrative of the public ministry is over, we have a purpose statement. It would seem to me the Holy Spirit is making it pretty clear that he, he gives hints of the purpose in some way in each Gospel. And I think it would be universally agreed that if that hint is going to be in Matthew, it's going to be at the very beginning. Because this introduction stands as an introduction to something. Now, I agree that based upon just Genesis 5.1, you would have a hard time saying it is the whole. But remember, Toledot is a unifying factor in the whole first division of the Torah, which we call Genesis. Uh, that the Toledot scheme is the scheme which undergirds the whole, not just the, the part. So I would put it this way, yeah, there is a secondary idea that this is the introduction to the first two chapters, that that Matthew is going to substantiate how Jesus is the son of David, the son of Abraham, and what that means. But more than that, once you think in terms of the book of the genealogy, it goes of, of Jesus Christ replacing Adam. It is more than just his kingly descent. 
his kingly ancestors. It is also the fact of why he has to become king and where his rule and what his rule entails. And that goes back to the echo of Adam. And so it would seem to me that this is the title, the introduction, the title to the book. This, this, is, this is the Holy Spirit given title to Matthew's gospel. It is the book, the gospel, of the Toledot generation, genealogy, but particularly here maybe even more generation of Jesus Christ. And his important link is not just Adam, but also David and Abraham. By the way, that would make, obviously, Jesus Christ, when you think in terms of that echo back to Adam, and then at the end, son of Abraham, the middle term, and remember, think like Jews, all right, that what's enveloped then shows what is most important because we're dealing with he's going to come to rule, and on the base of the Old Testament, he comes to rule as the son of David. And the son of David, who through the Abrahamic covenants, reverses through the salvation that comes the the, uh, the the sin and the loss of domination as king by Adam because of his sin. And so there's a very definite tie-in right away in Matthew's gospel back to the Old Testament. And Matthew is going to show how, in a sense, Jesus is the continuation and culmination of the Old Testament narrative. What began in the Torah, what began in Genesis continues and comes to a measure of completion through the narrative that is in Matthew's gospel. Because even though the kingdom has not yet been established, Matthew, as we've already seen in chapters 24-25, uh, is going to conclude in the final discussion of Jesus. Jesus is going to look all the way to the end and talk about the establishment of the kingdom is going to come in the future. And so Matthew really completes what began in the Old Testament. And there's, there's the essential purpose of Matthew. And so everything else in the New Testament, if we can put it this way, is just filling in details of how Jesus has completed and will culminate what began in the New Testament. But in the same way that the Torah was the skeleton that, and all the rest of the Old Testament just basically gives commentary upon that skeleton that is in the Torah. The same thing is true in the New Testament. Matthew becomes the essential foundation, the essential skeleton, and basically the rest of the New Testament just fills in details of what's in Matthew. And then providentially, by the Holy Spirit during the church age, the New Testament book that has been most studied by the church is... Matthew, in the same way that the most intensively studied part of the Old Testament within Judaism was the Torah. And basically, if you got the firm foundation, then the rest makes sense. And that's true of the New Testament as well. And I will put it this way, gentlemen, you will understand the New Testament to the extent that you understand the Gospel of Matthew. It's a key to unlocking what is, uh, what is in the New Testament. It's essential, and uh, everything else just uh, fills in essential details from this book. So and you say you got all that from one verse? Well, it's a potent verse. It's the introduction. And that uh, helps us to appreciate the whole. Now, significantly, you know, getting back to uh, to the outline, and and really, to, I, I I should, in fact, I'll make a note of myself to update my my outline because because uh, technically, in my understanding, the prologue per se, the narrative per se, begins in verse two. That uh, verse one is I've already corrected uh, Mark uh, that uh, really the 
the first division is this first introductory statement, or it's not part of the division, it's, it's set apart. It is the title of the book as a whole. All right, and so how does the narrative begin? Well, like a good Old Testament narrative, it begins with a genealogy. All right, the person who's going to be the, the centerpiece of the narrative is introduced by genealogy. And by the way, notice in the title, and we've already said this, the emphasis upon David. David comes before Abraham. David is central between Jesus Christ and Abraham. And so there is a unique emphasis upon David. Also, the, as, as we go through the, the genealogy, we find in verse 17, Matthew's summary is, there were 14 generations from Abraham to David. David, a deportation, 14 generations. And the deportation to Christ, 14 generations. So you would assume between verse 2, Abraham, to verse 16, Christ, there'd be 42 names. And you find only 41. Well, how do we get 42? Well, significant in verses 11 and 12, we come to the point of deportation. And obviously the deportation is, is the culmination of 14 generations from the deportation is 14 more generations to Christ. So we don't have a name there. We just get to uh, uh, Jeconiah. And uh, Jeconiah is uh, taken to Babylon, and in Babylon uh, to Jeconiah was born Shetiel. So deportation is twice. Uh, not as it were the individual itself, but in verse 6, and to Jesse was born David. David is the final number 14 from Abraham. But then in verse 6, and to David was born Solomon. David becomes the beginning of 14 that culminates in Jeconiah. What does this do? It emphasizes of all of the names, all the 41 names, the man who gets, as it were, double emphasis is David. Now that's within the text itself. He's the son of David in the introduction before the son of Abraham. And uh, in what Matthew says, all right, to get the 42 names, you got to double David. But he goes even further, 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations. And then now you've got to know the Hebrew underlying the Greek. And whether an individual at, uh, at Matthew's day knew Hebrew or not, a Jew would know the numerical, the, the numerical value of David's name was 14. Because remember in the Old Testament that instead of writing out numbers later on, the scribes would just choose certain, certain letters to represent numbers. And, uh, and with David, uh, the three consonants would add up to 14. So even the 14 gives a, another emphasis upon David. So all, all of this to say that by the time we get to one from verses 2 to 17, what is most impressed us is that Jesus is the son of David, and more than that, through Joseph, has title to the throne of David. Because notice in 116, to Jacob was born Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom, feminine, was born Jesus, who's called Christ. But in the next narrative, uh, we find that Joseph is, uh, is commanded by the Lord to take Mary as his wife. And the son that she bears, and by the way, Joseph is not involved physically. It's only by Mary Jesus Christ was born. 
but Mary becomes the wife of Joseph, and so Joseph gets the legal rights associated with Joseph. And the legal right is the fact that Joseph, because of his relationship to David, has the right to the Davidic throne legally. So why a genealogy? Why this genealogy? Because it shows Jesus' legal right. In other words, if the Davidic throne was established in Jesus' day, who had the legal right to the throne? Jesus. Because he's the legal son of Joseph. Now, by the way, if you're a Jew, this, this, this creates all kinds of problems. Because Jesus had no heirs. Which means what to the Davidic line? What about the promise that will never lack a man to sit on the throne? That was promised by God to, to David, 2 Samuel chapter 7. In other words, by 117, you're faced with a dilemma. If Jesus is not the Messiah, Israel has no king. If he's not going to reign, there's, there's no second choice. Well, how about Jesus' son? Well, he had none. Well, what does that do to God's promise? Now, you've got to realize that Matthew is writing to assure Jewish Christians that what they believe about Jesus is true. That they are being, being confronted as they go back to their diasporal homes by Jewish family and friends who are saying, if Jesus was the Messiah, what happened to the king? Hey, we're, we're still living among the Gentiles. The Gentiles still are exercising authority. How could Jesus be the Messiah? Well, Matthew's going to get there, but first he's going to establish very, very clearly there is, there is no doubt Jesus was the Messiah. And here it is. It begins with the genealogy. He had the right to the throne and to the present time. He is the only one who has a right to the throne. So the genealogy is very, very important. And then very quickly, because of time, and then we have these, these narratives punctuated by five fulfillment passages that show us that in the events surrounding the birth of Jesus, which is very, very important because, you know, before you were born and as a baby, you have very little effect upon the events that take place in your life. How many of you chose your mother? How many of you chose where you were going to be born? How many of you chose what your parents were going to do with you in the first uh, two or three years of your life? And so much so for the Passover plot that uh, you know, Jesus set apart to uh, believing, this, being deceived that he was the Messiah, he took a look at all of the passages of the Old Testament perceived by Israel of his day as being messianic and set out to fulfill them. Now, I have no evidence that that was propounded in Jesus' day. It's just, uh, uh, just a, a Jewish uh, attack of uh, the last couple of generations. Well, of course, Jesus thought he fulfilled the Old Testament, and the disciples did, because he set out to do it. Well, that's already been answered by Matthew's Gospel. No, he didn't. Uh, he was just a, a passive participant as Messianic was, prophecy was fulfilled in the events surrounding his birth. So he gets the proper mother, a virgin, to fulfill Isaiah chapter 7, 14. He's born in the proper place, Bethlehem. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, to fulfill Micah 5, 2. He's taken to Egypt. Chapter 2, verses 13 to 15, to fulfill Hosea 11, 1. 
Herod kills the baby boys, all the male children in Bethlehem, to fulfill Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 15. And he is taken to live in Nazareth, that he might be called a Nazarene, and so fulfill, huh? Because the Old Testament never mentions Nazareth. Now, whether through direct messianic prophecy, Isaiah 7, 14, Micah 5, 2, or through typological understanding, Hosea 11, 1, Jeremiah 31, at least we have direct passages. But what do we do with this fifth fulfillment? He's called a Nazarene. What does that fulfill? Well, some, based upon sound alike, say, well, he was a Nazarite, but he wasn't. Because he came eating and drinking, chapter 11. The Nazarite was John. So if he was a Nazarite, he was a very poor Nazarite. And so because of that, none of the commentaries I've recommended take that position, although it is out there. You know, based again upon the, the thinking about Hebrew, the consonants. But, uh, but it's, it's basically a sound alike. Now, close to Nazir is branch. And so some see that the prophecy here is going back to Isaiah 11, 1, or Jeremiah 23, Zechariah 3, or 6, that he is the branch, the, the, uh, the, the branch out of the stump of Jesse. But probably better is notice in verse 23 of Matthew, spoken through the prophets, plural, that Matthew does not have in mind a specific prophet, or we might put it this way, a specific prophetic oracle. He is looking at something which is seen throughout the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Now, he shall be called a Nazarene is, is within Matthew's statement, i.e., one from Nazareth. And we have to realize that one from Nazareth in that day was one who was uh, considered uh, to, uh, uh, to be humble, lowly. Uh, Nazareth was a town that was looked down upon. It was not a city of influence. In fact, it was among the Gentile territory and was, was almost viewed as an unclean city by the Jews because of its location. And so really what's being emphasized is, is by being brought up in Nazareth, being associated by Nazareth, Jesus was of humble, obscure, despised background. And that ties into a lot of prophetic passages that uh, talk about the fact that when the Messiah came, he would be humble. And there is nothing about him, humanly speaking, that would draw Israel to him. And one of the ways in which, basically, the Messiah was repulsed by, by Israel is the fact that he came from Nazareth. And uh, you can take a look at John chapter 7, the Sanhedrin debating. And uh, when uh, Nicodemus said that, uh, you know, uh, possible that Jesus was the Messiah, the the uh, majority of the Sanhedrin, well, well, check the prophets. No prophet comes from Galilee. And so the fact that Jesus would be known in that day as either the son of Joseph or Jesus from Nazareth, well, from Nazareth right away has no Messianic connections whatsoever. Now, Matthew has made it very, very clear. He was Jesus from Nazareth because that's where he grew up, not where he was born. But nevertheless, that title was used against him. And again, is, is it one of the ways in which the prophets were fulfilled, that Jesus was despised 
He was looked down upon. He was ridiculed. And certainly he cannot be the Messiah because he's Jesus from Nazareth. But of course we know that even that, as Matthew says, fulfills what the prophets said about the Messiah. Now, taking all that into effect, into account, the first two chapters of Matthew made it very, very clear that Jesus is the king. He's the king by right of genealogy. He is the king affirmed by the fulfillment of messianic prediction from the Old Testament. So, Jesus is the Messiah. But Matthew's gospel does not end there. Because if he is the king, what about the kingdom? Now, obviously, Matthew is going to continue to emphasize and point out how Jesus Christ fulfills messianic prophecy. But now he's going to turn more to to emphasize his messianic credentials, to emphasize his messianic mission. And that's where we'll pick it up on Tuesday, beginning in Matthew chapter 3.